So my name is Kelly Potter. I'm a professor um, of philosophy at Utah Valley University. And uh, I do research in the philosophy of religion um, and also the philosophy of gender and logic as well. Uh, th those, and that's the stuff I teach, uh, sci science and gender, stuff like that. Um, and I have done a lot of stuff on Mormon uh, theology, mostly. A little bit of what you might call more Mormon studies stuff, but mostly Mormon theology, uh, kind of taking an analytic theology approach to doing theology. Um, and Could you explain what an analytic approach is? Oh, yeah, so uh, it, it's sort of the, the kind of theology that's done by people who are analytic philosophers. And analytic philosophers pay attention to arguments a lot, um, the logic of arguments, um, the kind of language being used. They pay attention, they want to, you know, make sure to define their terms carefully and clearly and, and so on. Um, so that's what I'm referring to, is the application of the tools of analytic philosophy to doing theology. Um, so, so yeah, I wrote quite a, probably a dozen articles. Um, this was an element in other places? Yeah, yeah, in Element. Um, uh, I was actually the founding editor of Element for its first online edition. And then we, then we went to... Um, print only? Print, yeah, and online. It was going to be print and online. Okay. Uh, but it's the person who was the editor for a long time just wasn't publishing, wasn't publishing it. So... Um, like he just wouldn't get any of the issues done. So anyway, they, they were having an, they were having issues. But um, uh, at some point along the way, while I was doing this academic work on Mormon studies and Mormon theology, I was also at that time a believer. Although I would say I was a very um, you know like a radical believer, like a liberation theologian type. Um, trying to come up with a way of understanding Mormon theology from a liberation theological perspective. You know what liberation theology is. I need to find it. Sorry. Oh, okay. So liberation theology is really, it's a, it's a movement. I mean, you could define it more broadly, but it sort of started in the Catholic Church. But um, the idea is to interpret the Christian tradition from the perspective of the poor. Um, and liberation theologians in uh, Central and South America actually got involved in politics trying to change the political structures and economic systems in some of the countries there. So, for example, in uh, in the Sandinista revolution, you had people from the from the clergy that were actually involved in both, both the revolution part of it and in the construction of the government afterwards. Um, in fact, I think the minister of culture was a was a priest, Catholic priest who was a who was a liberation theologian. Oscar Romero, the famous Catholic priest from El Salvador, I think, uh, who was condemning the death squads and all of those murders, was himself, you know, um, assassinated for being kind of sympathetic to liberation theology. Uh, he was sent there by the Catholic Church to get rid of it, by the Vatican, right, to get rid of it, but um, because he was more moderate in his views, but the more he was in the position of being the bishop in Salvador, the more he, that he was in that, you know, worked in that position, the more he came to agree with liberation theology. Anyway, so the liberation theology in its content uh, deals with um, interpreting the Christian tradition from the perspective of um, the poor. And so, um, so for example, they're going, to, they're going to say salvation involves political liberation, right? And they're going to interpret sin as co the collective sin of the system that we have. And grace is coming together 
as a, as a community and being able to do stuff that none of us can do on, on, on our own. The body of Christ works through us, and, you know, that. So they interpret it in very concrete terms. Um, could you repeat that a bit? Uh, the sin and grace definition? Yeah, so sin, so sin uh, according to, well, at least some of the writers in the liberation theological tradition, they're going to say sin, like say original sin. Why is there original sin? Well, there's original sin because we, we are born into a system that's ex exploitative and we're all complicit in it because we all benefit from it. So those of us who benefit from it, you know, we're, we're complicit in that, which means that we're affected by the sin of it. So that's their interpretation of original sin, right? It, it would be about the material conditions of human life. The fact that there's the haves and the have-nots and that conflict is, you know, there's some people that are exploiting, you know, the mass majority of people. Is this right? at all conceptually similar to what's at least called critical race theory or BLM stuff where there's um, a sense of... There's some points of contact, yeah. With, with respect to what's the redemptive story being achieved and the, yeah. the sin yep. background. Yeah, in fact, liberation theology affected black... Um, theology and black ministry in the United States, right? James Cone is one of the famous liberation theologians, famous black liberation theologians, worth reading if you, you know, want to yeah, get kind of, uh, um, you know, a black perspective on it. Um, but it started, you know, it started in, in Central and South America, at least as far as I understand. I think there might have been some European liberation theologians earlier, and there were definitely, there have always been Christians in the Christian tradition who have argued for radical political transformation, right, as part of the Christian tradition. Are you out of uh, battery? No, we're good. Okay. Make sure the audio is getting picked up. Might move in a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was trying to apply that to Mormonism in, in some of my work. Um, but at some point, you see, I'm. I'm a trans woman, and I was in the closet, um, and at some point that conflict became paramount, and um, due to that and other personal stuff that was going on, I ended up uh, leaving Mormonism. At first I still, I was still a Christian, um, but For I even lost that belief after a while some like death burial resurrection beliefs or? oh no no not literalistically not yeah not a Christian like John Dominic Crossan is a Christian not like um, typical evangelicals are right yeah I, I, and I I did have that sort of belief the really literalistic belief um, uh, before I hit my adulthood but when when I became an adult and went on my mission it became what we called at the time a liberal Mormon somebody who's like, you know, in the liberal Protestant tradition, right? That type of, you know. Uh, and so I, I believed in some of it literally, but most of it not literally. Um, but I lost even the, you know, the last bit of literal belief that I had in an afterlife and in a good God. Um, and yeah, now I... I mean, the only, uh, I could believe in Spinoza's God, you know, the God that is just nature, right? But I couldn't believe in any kind of um, deity that is anthropomorphic in some sense, you what know, you mean, personal, 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 like, and cares about us and, um, you know, in other words, you know, the typical, the typical, uh, belief in God that you get in most Christian groups I couldn't accept. I mean, classic theism? Yeah, classic theism, but even other stuff, too. I mean, if, if I were to be a theist, I'd probably be a process theist at this point. Um, could, but, you, could you define that? Uh, process uh, theology is uh, an approach to theology which, well, to the concept of God in particular, but there's more to it than this. Uh, it's a, an approach to the concept of God that um, has God. It's kind of like open theism, but but more radical than open theism because God 
can only act by persuasion, not by coercion. And as, and as a result, omnipotence is totally denied. Um, in fact, they argue that omnipotence is, an, is incoherent, doesn't actually make sense. God is love, and they take that really, I don't know, kind of literally, because it's like God can only influence by loving, um, and the creation isn't done, that kind of stuff. If I were to go back into, you know, and start becoming a practicing Christian, my concept of God would probably be that. Um, and I would, of course, see Jesus and Jesus' life in the way that, like, the Jesus seminar does, and definitely not in the way that evangelicals do, right? Yeah. I mean, and that's the kind of Mormon I was. I wasn't one of those Mormons that was doing apologetics. Um, I do remember you yeah. being very passionate yeah. in the community, uh, presenting in a very enthusiastic, cheerful, just forceful in the sense that of uh, existential, maybe? Yeah, I've always been that way, yeah. Um, what, what did I talk on? What was the, do you remember? Oh, man. I remember the last talk I heard you give was on postmodernism, maybe? Or related to post, or maybe it was accused of yeah. sharing sensibilities with postmodernism. And I remember Blake Osler complaining that maybe that would undermine a view of justice. Mm. Hmm. Apologies for the uh, ambiguity. I forget. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't remember that. Yeah, so, um, so, you know, being trans isn't something that's compatible with being in the LDS church. It's that easy. For a lot, for a while, people who were queer and, and trans in, in the church thought, okay, maybe. So practically there are, it seems like there's some people that are trans that are still in the LDS church and they're still attending. But yeah. for you to be LDS means they, more than that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they have like a secondary status. They can't, they, they have the same status that blacks did before 1978, right? Um, meaning that they, they can go to church. It's like, yeah, you can go to church and you can do that kind of stuff, but no you're, you're probably not going to have a calling and definitely no temple recommend. Right. Yeah, so, and that, for a lot of Mormons, the temple's the big thing. For me, it never was, so I never cared whether I had one or not. Um, and, uh, you know, when, so when I left, I, I, that's not something, it wasn't about that. It was, yeah, it was definitely, I don't know, it was just like an overall kind of change of life. Um, oh, that opened up the possibility for me to come out and, you know, live my authentic self instead of repressing being trans. Could you talk a little bit about your view of um, identity and freedom, uh, what it means to be yourself? And there's different, like, philosophies of what even it means to have an identity. Uh, yeah. Well, okay, so that's a, that's a really big question. I don't know that I can answer that, like, really well quickly um but in terms of just my trans identity what that means is i mean this is just the way i this is the well there's a subjective part and then there's like a theoret sort of theoretical or objective part the subjective part is my experience is that um my self-image is female and i was born uh, you know assigned male at birth um and as a result of that, the feeling that I, or that, that I have this self-image of myself being female, it's actually self-image of myself having a female body, not necessarily doing typical female things. It's more focused on the body, the biology, um, and the way my body actually was, right, because of having testosterone. Um, that, there's a clash there. It, it's called gender dysphoria. and that clash causes a lot of mental anguish. Uh, and for the longest time, of course, what people tried to do was um, do reparative therapy or conversion therapy to help trans people just accept who they are. Um, but one doctor at some point was having just too many of his patients commit suicide, so he decided to go ahead and start giving them hormones, and it worked. They wanted hormones, they wanted to make their bodies more feminized, um, and interestingly, this worked at reducing the suicide rate from over 40% to below 10%. And so the therapy, the clinical world was dragged by the 
the empirical evidence um, that they needed to not try to convert trans people, but just accept them in their identity, help them transition. Um, at the same time, you had um, studies being done on the brains of trans people. Uh, one study showed that trans women, their brains um, in, in an area near the hypothalamus, their brains matched the cis women, or in other words, non-trans women, not the cis men, like you might expect because of the common biology. And you might say, well, it's because they all went on hormones, but actually, one of the trans brains that was examined, so this is after death, so post-mortem examination, at least one of them, if not several of them, were um, trans women who never had access to hormones, so they never actually did the physical medical transition, but they just lived as trans women. Um, so essentially what they found, and they re replicated the study with another kind of study using more advanced technology just last in the last 10 years in the Netherlands. They did this on children that identified as trans. It's more acceptable there. And they, they just found that that area of the brain is different in kids with gender dysphoria. Um, in other, and in other words, trans girls match cis girls. In other words, those who were assigned male at birth, who identify as, as girls, their brains matched cis girls' brains in the same area. The current theory is that because of the hormone, the way, the role that hormones play in differentiating the whole body, not just you know your primary and secondary sex characteristics, but also the brain, um, because of the role that hormones play, it's possible for things to get lined up in a different sort of in a non-binary way, right? Where maybe the body someone ends up with is going to be identified as male by the doctor, but the area of brain that gives them a sense of the, their own self, that area actually identifies them as female. Um, and that's what I think is going on with, um, when I say I'm a trans woman and I identify as a woman, that's what I mean is that um, I have this experience of, of contradiction between the way that my brain wants to understand myself and the way that my body is. And um, that sense of contradiction, dissonance, led me to be suicidal throughout most of my life. I had suicide ideation since I was a teenager and it was, it was related to this. Um, and at one point I was cognizant of being trans, but it didn't come out because it was so awful at the time. Treatment of trans people was just horrible in the, in the 80s and 90s. Um, and so I lived in the closet for a long time, um, which was easier because of the fact that although I'm a trans woman, I'm attracted to women. And so if I'm living in the closet, you know, as a trans, trans woman, um, you know, I can be heterosexual, so to speak. I mean, I, I, I wasn't really, but um, so that conflict, that's the conflict. Um, and uh, really, when it comes down to it, that's what pushed me out of the, that's what pushed me out of the, the LDS church. I mean, there's, you know, I could go on about all of the other stuff that causes people to leave, but I knew about all those things before I actually came around to leaving. Can we talk a little bit about your worldview now? What, how do you see the world? Um, I asked you earlier before this about uh, truth, correspondence theory of truth. Uh, in what sense is that adopted or not adopted? Uh, any sort of realism? Mm -hmm. And then, um, I actually forget the, the category for it, but it was the sense of constant conflict uh, or uh, a sense of uh, Contradiction. contradictions being an explanatory framework. Yeah, so I, um, so I, I now see, I'm not a theist. Um, <clears throat> I re I've read a lot of um, Buddhist philosophy, very specifically Buddhist philosophy, not as much, not necessarily Buddhist religion and stuff, but mostly just Buddhist philosophy stuff. And I kind of agree with the Four Noble Truths. There's suffering in the world. Um, it's caused by, uh, you know, craving, attachment. Um, and 
solution to that is to get rid of attachment, right? And so I agree with the first, with the first three noble truths. I don't know about the Eightfold Noble Path, but, um, but I do agree with them, except that I want to say, look, when it comes to attachment, sometimes my suffering comes from the uh, other's attachments. So, for example, sometimes the suffering of people in the world is the result of the fact that we have this ruthless capitalist system where some people control um, a vast amount of wealth. Very few people control a vast amount of wealth, and the vast majority of people on the planet actually, um, you know, have relatively little. Um, that kind of situation is one where the attachment of some human beings, namely the capitalists, um, uh, causes suffering for other human beings. And so they could be Buddhists all they want, these poor people, and that's not going to help them, right, because their suffering's not going to go away. So that's why I'm not fully, I wouldn't call myself a total Buddhist, because I think Marxism has to step in there. Um, or, you know, some, you know, Marx and the tradition that Marx is part of, the communist and socialist tradition, which actually started before Marx. Marx is part of that tradition. Can you give some uh, definition to the Marxism and communism that you told Yeah. To? So, um, I think Marx understood the nature of how capitalism works, the fact that it's based on class conflict, um, and that their conflict or contradiction is is an important part of how we understand how history proceeds, um, especially in terms of the contradiction between political and economic forces of different sorts. Right. So in capitalism, it's the capitalists and workers and peasants, um, and those are different classes with different interests, and those interests come into conflict. Um, and uh, capitalism is exploitative based on the profit motive um, and as a result it's not going to be the best system for the greater part of humanity um, it's a good system for some people who are who benefit from it including a lot of a lot of very highly skilled and educated workers in the United States right um, but workers mostly in other places in, in the world um, you know, are exploited. Um, so, let me see. So that's kind of, I mean, the basics of Marxism is, you know, that history is driven by contradictory forces between economic classes, different economic classes. Um, and we want... Perpetually without yeah. utopia. There's no, yeah. there's nothing, there's no alternative in sight. Yeah. It's only ever going to be that... Well, well, no, there, it, there are alternatives, but it's hard to see them. But things will change. Things do change. We've gone through lots of different economic systems. So, for example, we have... In terms have, of conflict, though, the, the, the reality of that conflict is perpetual? Oh, um, I think that you can... Okay, so, yeah, at one level it is. There's always going to be opposition in, in everything. That's a principle that I still believe from Mormonism, right? That's actually a principle in Mormon theology as well. Um, there's going to be an op opposition in everything. Um, but I, uh, as a socialist and, um, and actually, you know, a communist, so that's the kind of socialist I am, is a communist. I defend the socialist countries like the former Soviet Union, even though I, you know, there are problems with what happened in the 30s, and also China in particular, which I think is more successful, dramatically more successful than the Soviet Union was um, there were problems during the Cultural Revolution but the difference between those countries and this country is who the ruling class is and there it's the Communist Party which represents the interests of the workers here it's you know the capitalists ultimately they get what they want they'll get the candidates they want usually and when they don't they'll put they'll keep the candidates from being able to do anything um, or you know the the elected officials from being able to do anything radical or change things in a radical way. Um, and I want to change that, right? So I want to have a, a an economy that is planned, although some market forces like you see in Vietnam and China, um, rather than a purely planned state-run economy, the way that 
Um, some of the socialist countries have approached it, like Cuba and the Soviet Union. Uh, so I believe in market socialism. Um, and of course, the goal is to get to a classless society where, pe where the economic differences between people are so nominal that they they just don't make that much of a difference, right? Um, so, does that make sense? Yeah. Could you speak a little bit to intersectionality and critical race theory? Uh, those are words that I think a lot of my audience would be interested in, and the categories or definitions, and maybe how that relates to any of this. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so intersectionality is this idea that that was that Kimberly Crenshaw came up with. Um, it it's the idea that. Well, actually, let me talk about something before we talk about intersectionality. So identity politics. So identity politics um, arose in um, the 60s and 70s. And essentially what it was was, you know, people in various groups that were dominated or marginalized in some way, they, um, uh, they advocated for themselves and for their group, right? So you get this with... Um, you know, people in the civil rights movement. You get this with people in the gay rights movement, which started around the same time. Um, and yeah, so so they they're all advocating for their own groups, their own identity, right? Um, and in particular, in feminism, there were lots of white women in the beginnings of feminism, and even later in feminism, that were advocating for their views. And these women were, you know, relatively well off materially speaking and so their their concerns and their interests were really different than really poor women or black women and so some some black women started to point out point that out to these white feminists well wait actually the things that you're at that you want to to achieve it doesn't it wouldn't help us so like being able to get jobs outside the you know the home well we're already working domestic labor right for hardly anything that's how we even can survive we have to get jobs out of the home it's not a career it's like you know a job it's a hard job and and we get paid hardly anything for it but we have to do it just to survive that's a totally different kind of issue also uh, white women don't see the ways in which the mass incarceration of the black population especially the black male population in the united states has had a negative impact on um you know, women's issues from a black perspective. So in other words, what they wanted to say was this, you can't talk about race independent, or sorry, you can't talk about gender issues and gender oppression independent of race. And you can't do it independent of sexual orientation either, right? For the same reason, there are different concerns. So we started thinking in terms of intersection, the intersection of various groups and the way that you, you get around in society has to do with the intersection of those groups. So I'm white and I'm a trans woman. I don't face anywhere near the kind of violence that a black trans woman would. Just because my white background, my middle class background makes it so that I'm gainfully employed um, and I live in a suburban area, a you know, relatively safe suburban area. I don't have to turn to sex work just to survive, which a lot of uh, trans women of color have to do. Their lives are dangerous. Their life expectancy is in their 30s, right? Um, I do face transphobia, um, trans ignorance, that kind of stuff to some extent, um, but not to the extent that they do. So I can't just talk about trans issues. I have to talk about them as intersecting. Um, so then crit critical race theory, most critical race theorists recognize the need for talking about the intersectionality, but I would say that usually when we're talking about that expression, unless we mean it in just the narrow sense that applies to legal theory, um, and that is not, can't be what everybody's talking about because that isn't of that much interest, right, outside of law schools. Um, but if, if you're looking at it in the broader what that term might mean in a broader sense. It's just the idea that we have to see U.S. history as being shaped fundamentally by race. 
and it's white supremacy. So it's a kind of a, you know, and then there are certain tools that are used, tools that come from what's called critical theory, um, which traces back to people like Marx and the Frankfurt School, um, but it's not just it's not just Marxists, right? It's other kinds of theorists, mostly on the left, right? Yeah, in fact, I think you would identify almost all of them as on the left, but they're various different types of left-wing views, like anarchism or Marxism or you know democratic socialism or um, environmental, you know, feminism. You know, just various different kinds of left-wing views. Um, so. Uh, so yeah critical race theory in that sense would definitely need to be intersectional because we have to recognize that patriarchy affected the women the black women who were enslaved even though slavery was probably the main way that they were oppressed they were also oppressed by the patriarchy too and it meant that their lot was worse sometimes than most of the time than the men who were black slaves, right? Um, so, could you tell us what you're working on these days? Uh, what projects you have? Um, what, what, what's yeah. mostly interesting you? So, I have a uh, a book that I'm working on. I don't have a publisher yet. It's it's probably going to be well. It's about re uh, religious heterodoxy. I'm and the nature of religious belief. I'm arguing that um, with regard to religious belief, you can never in a non-question-begging way determine the difference between orthodoxy and heterodoxy. Or, in other words, you know, the right belief and some different interpretation, which may or may not be heretical, right? Um, and so I'm arguing that we, and when we understand religious belief, we have to understand it as involving in, you know, internal disagreements within the religious traditions. So, like, you know, Christianity is a really good example of this because there are a lot of disagreements. Um, you know, it, it would be—it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that Catholics, Catholic theology, and evangelical Protestant theology are significantly different <laughs> in in a lot of ways, um, and that maybe it even gets to the point, at least for some Catholics and some evangelicals that they don't even have the same concept of God, right? A lot of people would say Mormons don't have the same concept of God as the rest of Christianity. Um, but when you really look at the diversity of concepts of God, you realize, wow, there is really a lot of different concepts here. And um, so there's, I think it's kind of an illusion to think there is such a thing as a unified thing as Christianity. The word makes it sound like you've got a unified group, but really what you have is, sorry, a divided group, groups that are arguing about how to interpret their tradition. Um, and so that to me is a really important aspect of religious belief that people don't pay enough attention to. So I'm writing a book arguing that we need to pay attention to it and then showing how we can go back through some of the philosophical and theological tradition through the framework of that of heterodoxy, um, you know, seeing how religions um, develop, how religious belief develop, what, what religious belief is through this idea that, well, you know, there's always an orthodoxy, there's always a heterodoxy, there's always another way of interpreting, you know, the same text or this, or the same, even the same creed, right? Um, you know, Catholics who are totally disagree about the Trinity, like the Latin Trinitarians versus the social Trinitarians, they're both going to say that they accept certain creeds because they have to, right? But um, but they disagree on how to interpret it. So there's no way. We try to pinpoint it. We try to pinpoint orthodoxy. I don't think we can. And I think that has a lot of implications for what we, how we should think about religion, including like how we should think about religious liberty, religious freedom. I think so. you mentioned earlier uh, your engaging the subject of religious liberty. Could you speak yeah. to that? And also, I'd, I'd be interested to hear you speak to um, maybe the trans issue as related to uh, religious liberty for doctors and convictions they have about uh, treating or not treating uh, oh, yeah, children yeah. or yeah. certain parties. That's exactly the kind of thing that, I'm, that I am going to write about. Yeah, so I argue that actually the existence of heterodoxy 
we can okay so actually let me take a step back so with respect to religious liberty or religious freedom we could talk about uh, let's call religious liberty the freedom to practice your religion the way that you see fit um, and we'll call religious uh, freedom the freedom from the domination of some religion right and those are those are two different freedoms um, and they, they often conflict and um, in the United States we've erred on the side of religious liberty I think rather than religious uh, freedom at least recently in certain kinds of cases so for example cases like the Baker right who want who didn't want to do a gay wedding cake and didn't want to do a trans birthday cake um, that kind of case you know there's kind of this general idea that well people should be able to do that they should be able to based on their religious beliefs deny service um, that's religious liberty I want to argue that when something is the kind of thing that we would make a law against it without uh, religious belief being a reason to do it, then religious belief shouldn't be a reason. In other words, I'm saying we should not have religious exceptionalism. We should, if, if you shouldn't be, if you should have to um, serve anyone who comes into your place, then you should have to serve anyone, including somebody who's gay or somebody who's trans doctors should have to treat people who are trans people who are gay they don't they shouldn't be able to claim that um, health insurance companies should have to give you all the kinds of health insurance that you know or you know the kinds of coverage that you might want including like birth control right so so I have my view about the relationship between the state and religion is quite different from the typical American view, whether you're talking about conservatives or even liberals. Um, I think we have too much religious liberty, not enough um, uh, religious freedom, freedom from the domination of religion. Uh, so I would sanction churches for being racist, for example, churches that don't allow blacks in. I would sanction them. I would want to say, no, they should be sanctioned by the state. They shouldn't be allowed to do that. They should be like taking their non-profit status should be taken away or something, some kind of sanction, not necessarily rounding them all up and shooting them, right? I mean, obviously that's like an extreme way of solving that kind of problem, but a sanction, you know, uh, soft sanctions. Um, I, I think that's what we should do. So same on the trans issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think, uh, for example, the LDS Church should lose its nonprofit status, and over its views on same-sex marriage and transgenderism. Yeah, yeah, and um, uh, maybe other things too, but at least those two. Yeah, um, I think that the public good trumps religious liberty. So yeah, so the views that I have are probably not, wouldn't be very popular in your congregation or even in your audience, I would imagine. Um, because even liberals, when I talk about the views that I have about religious freedom, liberals even are typically kind of taken aback uh, by it. Um, I mean, it, yeah, to give you kind of a, a, a simplistic sense of how I would argue is, you know, someone might say, well, look, this is, this is my Christian belief. I can't, I can't serve you, you know, I can't make a cake for you because this is my Christian belief. I want to say, okay, so you say it's your, it's, your, it's your Christian belief, but actually it's your interpretation of Christianity, and there are plenty of Christians that don't interpret it that way. So it's not Christian per se, it's just your personal view. Um, people like to, I think it's bad faith to say, I have to believe this because I'm Christian. No, no, no. People decide how to interpret Christianity, and there's so many different ways of interpreting it. Um, and, and, and it's often the case that the ways of interpreting, say, the biblical passages that supposedly talk about homosexuality, it's often the case that the ways of interpreting those where they don't condemn homosexuality in general are the most, you know, most plausible ways of interpreting them. You know, talk to biblical scholars, serious biblical scholars at universities, they're going to say, yeah, you know, 
that Sodom and Gomorrah story has nothing to do with homosexuality. Um, it has nothing to do with sex even. It has to do with something else entirely, something way more abusive, you know, way... I mean, Paul, what would be your view on Paul? Um, Especially with respect to... Well, I mean, my personal view on Paul is that there's some Paul stuff that's awful, <laughs> right? And there's other Paul stuff that's good. But... Um, so it's treatment on gender and sexuality yeah, and homosexuality. Yeah. I mean, I think there are definite... There were definite... Um, there's a bias there, right? And I would interpret, like, say, the Romans passage as... Well, actually, you know, I, it's not obvious totally to me that... I don't know. It's something I would have to think more about. You have to understand, I'm not still trying to be a Christian, right? Or interpret so I, the text. Yeah. Yeah. And even when I was a Mormon, I thought that Paul was wrong on... Um, because Mormons don't have an inerrancy of the Bible. So um, I thought Paul was wrong about the, uh, the pa- essentially the passages that you can interpret as Calvinist. Sorry. <laughs> the passages that you can interpret as Calvinist passages, that's where I thought he was wrong, exactly where I thought he was wrong. Um, but um, it seems to me that the Paul passages could be interpreted as being about something other than homosexuality. There's one Leviticus pa- passage that, um, you know, that condemns homosexuality. Yeah, and I think everybody's going to say, yeah, it does. But of course, that's a book that also condemns a whole bunch of other things that evangelicals don't care about, right? Mixed clothing, um, shrimp, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, you're, it's, it's just one in a list of a whole bunch of things that Christians actually don't really care about, except for when it comes to, you know, homosexuality and, and trans people. Well, homosexuality in that case. It does seem to be a distinction in Leviticus between expectations for the Mosaic community and expectations for the outsiders in the land of Canaan that were violated and which served as the ground for the conquest. Mm-hmm. So the, the rationale in Leviticus for certain ethics uh, is specific to concerns for the Israelites. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's yeah. ways that you have to respond to those interpretations, but I've read all of this stuff a long time ago and 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 I'm convinced that there's... I'm not convinced necessarily that I myself am a, would want to adopt a particular interpretation of a particular text. What I am convinced of is this. You can, there's always some way you can get around that, right? I mean, it's, it's not... Bible interpretation, it has a lot of flexibility in it. I think, I think when Christians say Christianity means I have to be anti-LGBTQ, you know, LGBTQ, that's bad faith. I don't believe that. Um, and by bad faith, I mean um, you're acting like it's Christianity that's telling you this. No, no, no. It's you that's telling Christianity this. You're interpreting it into the into the tradition. In your view, perhaps uh, those people ought to reconstruct their yeah, faith. Yeah, come up with another interpretation. You can um, do it fairly easily because I'm saying you know there's all these other inter- ways of interpreting those kinds of passages. Would would, would the end result necessarily have to be faithful to what seems to be the most plausible original intent of the authors of the text? Um, well, it's nice to try to get at that, but, you, but I mean, the best you can do is something like the Jesus Seminar did. I don't think many people, I, I know what that is, but I don't think people know what that is. So. Yeah, the Jesus Seminar people actually tried to take a scientific approach to, say, to the um, New Testament. I think just the four Gospels, but it might be the whole New Testament. Especially the synoptics, maybe. Yeah, the synoptics. And um, and and figure out, um, essentially, what did Jesus really teach? And when you do that, you end up with a very kind of minimal core doctrine. And it's not, it's not what either conservative, you know, Protestants want or what Catholics want, even. It's a, a publication where there's color coding. For diff- or maybe like shades mm-hmm. of uh, overlay of different parts of the synoptics describing what the Jesus Seminar s- scholars thought was uh, likely faithful representation of yeah, yeah. what he said and what was likely they thought made up. So they're kind of yeah. taking some uh, a scalpel maybe and, and yeah. deciding what they thought was yeah. legitimate. I mean, for me, as somebody who takes science as the ultimate arbiter, um, 
if you're going to try to figure out original intent, that's going to be about as close as you could possibly get. And even there, you're not going to get the original intent. Text, the idea of the idea of getting at the original intent of a text is, um, you know, that's it's transcendent. I'm a skeptic about the ability to do that. We read texts in terms of our lives. They're 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 dynamic. They change. The interpretations of them change. There are things that no current Christian could understand about how Christians in the first century saw things. Just because the world is so different, so fundamentally different. Our conceptual framework is different. Our way of thinking about things is different. We think about things in much more literalistic ways than they could have because we've over time ha been affected by you know, the tradition of philosophy but also the development of science. Um, all of that just changes our our whole framework right so I don't I, I don't think I don't I think that attempting to find out what what the original interpretation of a text is is itself something that it's you know a fool's a fool's errand it's yeah. not going to you're not going to be able to do it you're not going to be able to come you're not going to be able to come down to one interpretation and make it so reasonable that everybody who's a reasonable participant in that discussion is going to agree that that's the right interpretation. So the alternative to seeking original intent, say with scripture or the constitution, what interpretive mode or strategy do you suggest uh, well, I mean, to, to the finding original intent? I am not a believer in scripture, so it's hard for me to answer that question. Maybe law. Yeah. Well, with okay, so with law, I I think it means whatever the court in 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 liberalism it means whatever the courts say it does. I mean that's essentially that's it's however we interpret it now. That's what it means, right? It's, it's, so the text in that case isn't authoritative. Our interpretation of no, it no, it's authoritative, is authoritative in terms of all, it's authoritative in terms of the language it has there and all of the uh, prior um, the prior rulings precedents that have an effect on how we interpret that language um, so it's, it's kind of off topic but yeah. uh, I remember a paper I think it was an element by Nathan Oman yeah, yeah. about a jurisprudence I, I'm, I'm probably yeah, misremembering yeah. Uh, <laughs> a, pro, a jurisprudential approach to uh, nailing down Mormon doctrine uh, yeah, yeah, he, he, I, di I disagreed. I disagreed with Nate about almost everything, including that. Um, but, um, well, I mean, with respect to the Constitution, you have to understand you're not talking to somebody who is in the normal part of the political discourse in the United States. I'm far enough left that I don't care about the Constitution. I want a new one, totally new Constitution. Okay. Yeah. What What other topics? Would you like to close on what, what's interesting to you? Uh, no, it's it, this is about whatever you're interested yeah, okay. in. Yeah, okay. All right. I've, I've yeah. talked about a lot of stuff. So. Yeah. Well, I appreciate appreciate dialoguing with me. Uh, yeah. For sharing more. But I I have uh, some remaining questions that aren't in the flow of this. Um, what what would someone uh, what should someone look at if they wanted to get a feel for the current scene of Mormon? Philosophy, and I know that you're you're not necessarily in that in in the uh, inside of that community anymore, but uh, I know you've had a lot of background with it. Yeah. So if I wanted to have a better academic uh, exposure to Mormon philosophy and uh, modern expressions of it, and sort of the landscape of it, and I, I say I ask this um, knowing that this isn't of necessarily like front burner interest to you anymore but yeah, yeah. I, 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 it seems like you're uh, no, you, I still you, you know a lot about it, it. Yeah. yeah so I would say um, in Mormon philosophy I would read Adam S. Miller he's the person to read um, so one classic Blake Osler is, yeah. uh, no I, I'm not interested in the stuff that he does um, although you know, I mean, he did he did write a lot of a lot of stuff, and and he might be of interest to people in the evangelical community because he does talk or he interacts. Yeah, he interacts. Yeah. Um, whereas I, I doubt Adam Miller does very much. Um, maybe Joseph Spencer too. 
He's a religion professor at BYU with a degree in philosophy. Um, but the, in Mormon studies more broadly, I would say the most interesting books that have come out recently are a book by Taylor Petrie um, on the history of dealing with gender and sex in the LDS church. Um, it's called Tabernacles of Clay. I can't remember the publisher. It's either Oxford or Rutledge or something. And then um, uh, so Taylor Petrie, his book. Joanna Brooks has a book out um, about, Mor about uh, white, supremacy, white supremacy in Mormonism. Mormonism and white supremacy, I think is what it's entitled. Um, and it's a great book. It shows how deep white supremacist assumptions and systematic racism go in the Mormon tradition. Um, uh, and then there's another book um, uh, by, it was edited by Joanna Brooks and Gina Colvin, who's um, a former, she's former LDS and is now a member of the Community of Christ. I don't know if you know them. Yeah, yeah. Um, if I were to become a Mormon again, it would be that group, okay. right? Yeah. Um, and they, they they strike me as more like United Methodists today, the yeah. mainline denomination yeah. with people who don't necessarily agree with the fundamentals, the the, the, the tr historic truth yeah. uh, claims, but they're participating in a community that at least is yeah. I mean, those, to those it. narratives still mean something to them, but they don't think of the Book of Mormon as, as literally historical, but it means something to them. In the same way that a lot of the narratives that they would also say in the Bible are not literal or historical, they're still important. Like, say, the Genesis story, that's a narrative, right? Um, a lot of Christians don't believe it that literally, right? Um, a lot of Mormons do, a lot of evangelicals do, but, um, but a lot of Christians don't believe. Like, the United Church of Christ right over here, right, they're just a couple blocks over from here that's I, it strikes me as pretty similar to the way the community of Christ mm -hmm. is in terms of how pro, how progressive they are and uh, openness to various different interpretations anyway um, and historically I know there's Eugene England it was he helped he was a helpful yeah yeah he was he was good he he, he unfortunately died in 2002 or something um, and that was when I took over as the Mormon studies coordinator at UBU um, but yeah, I mean, he's a good person to read as a, as a, somebody who is willing to raise problems in the, con but from a faithful point of view, he was always, he wrestled. Yeah. He, yeah. He wrestled with problems, but he was always, he was always more loyal to the church than he was to the problems. Yeah. And then uh, Sterling McMurrin. Yeah, he was great. He was awesome. But that was a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Um, I would recommend reading his Theological Foundations of, of the Mormon Religion. If you want to get a kind of an overview of what Mormonism thinks, that's going to be the best place to start. Um, some people criticize his way of articulating it, but it's as good as any other from that time period. Um, but that's, that's old. Who, that, who's that's prior old to McMurrin? What, what philosophical LDS thinkers um, we're active. I would look at Orson Pratt. He has that a, goes way back. It, yeah, uh, he has an essay called "The Absurdities of Immaterialism," which is philosophically quite sophisticated for a 19th century, you know, a 19th century amateur. Actually, you know, the kind of and, t was it Talmadge, Roberts, and Witso? Were they interesting to you? Yeah, Roberts especially. Yeah, and to some extent, um, Witso and Talmadge too, but Roberts more so. I was interested in his stuff. And what works, uh, we close with this, what works would be best representative of how you think today uh, or that would get at an, an approximation of where you're at? Hmm. That's a hard question. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I would probably give some Buddhist philosophical texts and some Marxist philosophical texts. Um, so, Nargajuna or Nargajuna, I don't know whether, which way it's pronounced, but he's a first-century Buddhist philosopher who 
Um, although I don't always agree with him, he's really interesting. Very compelling arguments. Um, predated Hume with Hume's kind of skepticism. I mean, long before Hume, he had the same kind of skepticism about the existence of the self um, and causation. Um, yeah, I would say Nargajana. And then, ah, Marx. Probably um, the German ideology, his piece to German ideology. Uh, I'm in the book on heterodoxy, I'm writing a chapter on Marxism and, um, and religion. It's on Engels. So I actually, more than Marx, I might say, I might recommend reading Engels on religion. He, the reason that I say that is because Engels was ambivalent. On the one hand, he was, like Marx, very critical of religious belief. Um, but at, on the other hand, he also saw the revolutionary potential in it, and so he talked about that. Um, it's almost like he was anticipating later liberation the theology. So I like Engels' stuff a lot. I think he's kind of an underrated philosopher. Um, and then there's a Russian philosopher that I really like named Ival, Ivald Ilyenkov. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, I just read it in English because I don't read Russian, but he has some. He has a book called The Dialectics of the Ideal and another one on dialectical logic, both of which are really interesting to me. Um, some of the Soviet philosophy that happened after the death of Stalin during the more open period that you get after, you know, with Nikita Khrushchev and so on, um, is really interesting. Some of that philosophy in that time period is really interesting. Um, but, yeah, I don't know how, inter how, yeah. how, uh, how much of interest yeah. it would be to your audience. I but, think yeah. you're good. Uh, yeah. Thank you for... Yeah, yeah. Your name was Aaron? Yeah, Aaron Shafawala. Aaron Shafawala.